Hola amigos, this is Coach Sean Swanham with the Samson Strength Coach Collective. Uh, this afternoon, we have Coach G from Livewire College. How's it going? Pretty well. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Hey, so um, looking at your uh, rap sheet, at your bio and everything, you spent some time over at uh, Hofstra in an internship. Um, I played at George Mason, so I've, I've been to Hofstra a couple of times at uh, Strong Island. Love it over yeah. there. Good food, of course. <laughs> Good place to be. And and then you also got your undergrad there as well, correct? Yes. Okay. So did you um with your time there, were you involved with, with sports beforehand or was it just an internship during your undergrad? Uh could you go into like a little bit of your history through that? It was the short answer is it was it was an internship. It was my seen like the it was my six credit senior year, you know, do this to graduate internship. Um I was involved in sports not with Hofstra athletics, but just, I had, you know, since I could do sports, I had been involved in them. Um, but I actually, um, three, I started as a, a video and television major and then three, and that, that's like why I was at Hofstra to begin with, because they have a great communications program. Um, and then three semesters in, I switched to exercise science. And then even once I got to that second semester, I didn't, know what i was going to do with it i i was enjoying the major so i knew that um but i still was like driving around um driving around town looking at gyms or pt places and stopping in and wondering okay is this something that i would like and then my professor katie sell said go to an internship with the strength conditioning department and i was there for maybe 20 minutes and thought yeah i, I, I can totally do this um and That's so bad. you know with every passing day, just more and more, it was, yep, I still like it. I still like it. I like it more. I like it more. Um, and then by the end of the semester, uh, I was fortunate enough to work with Coach Burt, um, was a great mentor in that he made it a priority to let me actually do stuff. So instead of just treating me like an intern that could clean up weights and, and take care of makeups and things like that, you know, he look for opportunities to say, okay, how about you run the second half of this session? Or how about you run, you know, once it got to a point where, hey, cross country's coming in, there's only eight of them, how about you just take them? And so having those experiences and getting that much of a taste of it right off the bat was enough for me to think, okay, yeah, I definitely want to do this. I would definitely want to get paid to do this. Beautiful. So like going into inter internship experience, you had another internship um, at Robert Morris University, correct? Mm -hmm. um, were because that's like your first taste of strength and conditioning over at Hofstra and like immediately like same thing with me like I knew I loved it this is what I want to do um, let's rock and roll let's, let's turn the music and jam um, were those pretty similar experiences in terms of your internship or, or how far apart were those I would say they were pretty similar the the Robert Morris internship I when I graduated Hofstra or, or before I graduated Hofstra I was sending out applications to everything that I could. And when I didn't, I didn't hear back almost at all, like from anybody, let alone even get very far in the interview process. Um, I sort of accepted that I would be spending the next year at home. So I was working at Gold's Gym in Pittsburgh and I sent an email out to, because I, I knew I wanted to be a, strength, a college strength coach. And so I sent an email out to everybody that, every school that I was willing to drive to every day and said, Hey, who wants a free intern? Like who just, who, who will let me come by the weight room and, and be there. And Todd hammer at Robert Morris was the only one that emailed me back and they had a formal internship program, but he, uh, they were full in that regard. So in terms of like participating in the curriculum, he said, you know, the classroom sessions and things like that are kind of spoken for, but, as far as I'm not going to tell you to leave the weight room. So if you come by, no one's kicking you out. Um, so he, <laughs> uh, and, and, and it wasn't just a shadowing thing either. Like, you know, I, I was setting up and breaking down the room. I was spotting athletes. I got athletes, got to know me. I got to know them. So in terms of what I did, um, it, it was very, very similar to Hofstra and, I was just as lucky to work with Coach Hammer as I was with Coach Burt because they both, again, treated me like a young coach as opposed to an intern. Right. Especially when you have a little bit of uh, experience, you know, yeah. uh, under your belt, you can move around with that. Now, it's super interesting. I, I like asking about internships because, of course, if we have um, 
younger coaches that are listening and, and they're getting into that or if they, if they want to, uh, if they have the ability to, um, usually like when you graduate undergrad, you're not going to be an assistant somewhere or you're not going to mm-hmm. be possible. You get a GA ship. Um, but the internship is always interesting to me because, um, they're so variant in terms of like what you can do. Like a lot of interns, like I've had friends that just set up the weight room and then they get out of the way and then they break it back down and they clean things yeah. and they get water. Um, and that is what it is, of course, too. Um, but it sounds like you were like really active in that. Um, within that internship, were you, you said you're working at Gold. Was that something that you kept up with at the same time? Were you kind of, you know, lighting the candle at both ends in that regard? Yeah, I, they, they, you know, Coach Hammer knew that I needed to make money. And Gold's Gym didn't really care about anything else that I was doing. But I made them aware that, hey, I'm unavailable at these times because I'm working somewhere else. So uh, they both. It, I, I made them both work. Um, if I remember, it was uh, it, it basically was mornings at RMU and then mid afternoons or slash and or evenings at Gold. And I was, I was still living at home, like living with mom and dad. So it was mm-hmm. I, Gold's definitely wasn't Gold's was paying the bills, and by bills I mean like you know my half of the cell phone bill that my parents were still helping me with. Like I wasn't I'm definitely not about to say that, Oh yeah, I totally made a, a full time income at Gold's gym and managed to intern at the same time. Like, no, that was that was very much not a thing. My my parents were still helping me out quite a bit. Yeah, I mean that's important because like uh you gotta have a a, a good idea of where you're grounded and you gotta be able to make some money. Like even as a GA yeah. course too. Um yeah, it's less to have your parents around for that for sure. Like same yeah. thing on and my end. I was doing not only that, you know, that was the, the closest thing that I could get to working in, in college strength and conditioning, uh, which wasn't very close, working at Gold's Gym, but, you know, with the even more, and by that I mean not very much spare time that I had, I was um, power washing decks and hanging Christmas lights as well. So, uh, you know, making 10 bucks, sorry, government, but making $10 an hour cash <laughs> um, on the weekend. So it was like Monday through Friday was spend the mornings at RMU, spend the afternoons at, uh, Gold's and then Saturday, Sunday work for Bob at, uh, at, uh, d- doing Christmas lights and, and painting and power washing and, uh, si- you know, power sanding decks for people much wealthier than me. Yeah. I, it's, uh, yeah. Again, the struggle and the grind, but manual labor yeah. is good for this whole, right? So where, where was your, did you jump to the private facility after that? It, in the, in the private sector, I think you were working with um, some hockey athletes in Pittsburgh as well. I did, but I was at, I, I, so the, the RMU thing only lasted for like, I think barely even, three, even if three months, because I got a graduate assistantship just all, I, I don't want to say on a whim because I was still qualified enough that they hired me, but they, uh, I learned this later, like they're, their first it was is at Waldorf University in, in Forest City, Iowa, and their their first guy backed out. Uh, but he it wasn't just that he informed them politely, "Hey, I'm sorry, I can't take this." Like he just disappeared off the face of the earth, and they kept trying to reach out and kept trying to reach out. And soon enough, it was like, "Okay, we have two weeks until the semester starts, and we have no idea where the guy that we hired is." So they basically said, or you know, the the assistant that was taking care of the hiring was told, okay, the next person that gives you a resume with the CSCS and has a pulse, call him, and if he speaks English, <laughs> then hire him. Welcome to <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> yeah. and, that, and that's really how it was. Like, I, I sent the resume in in the evening. I got a phone call the next morning. I did the follow up phone call with the head coach that evening, and he said, okay, when can you get here, and what teams do you want? <laughs> And, that, and, and then fast forward two years later and I had a free master's degree and two years of hands-on, on the floor, day-to-day programming, coaching, and working with, with college athletes. Right. How did that experience as a GA, um, how did that juxtapose against doing the internships beforehand? Like you had an internship, of course, in New York, had one back home uh, near RMU or at RMU rather. Uh, and then now you're jumping all the way out to Iowa. Um, there's a little bit, a little bit different in their reports too culturally culturally for sure um the the work really wasn't uh, that different if, if any different at all and in, it it is because of the previous point that i made about how coach burt and coach hammer both said okay like you're a young coach let's have you coach 
So when I got to Waldorf, it was still a, a pretty big shock because it was, it was just, okay, there's your team. Go ahead and be the strength coach. But it was, it was a shock in just that, oh, wow, you're giving me all this responsibility. Cool. It wasn't a shock of, I have no idea what to do. Um, so there were plenty of mistakes that I made and I was 22 years old, but in, right. in the grand scheme of things, I was able to assimilate pretty immediately into, okay, here, you know, this is more or less my full-time job, uh, because I was treated as such whenever I was an unpaid intern. Yeah. It sounds uh, the, like you, uh, cult- culturally it was, uh, <laughs> the, uh, everybody was nicer in Iowa. <laughs> like <laughs> one way to like put working it. on Long Island and working in New York, like if you don't make a point in three seconds, like you just get talked over. Like, like, all right, you're you're boring. You, I just it's my turn to talk now. But um, Iowa, and, and it was not only was it Iowa, but it was middle of nowhere Iowa. It was like it was so far north uh, in Iowa that we actually played our hockey games in Minnesota, in uh, Albert Lee, Minnesota. Um. And so it was just the smallest. There's 2,500 people in the whole town. There were 300 people in the whole school, and 200 of them were athletes. Like, like the school only existed because, and really only exists currently, uh, because of the money that they make from partial athletic scholarships. Like, they're, if, they, if athletes stopped going to Waldorf, I don't know how they would support themselves. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to, to, to paint them in a negative light. Like, um, I'm just describing the size of the, the the relative size of the school. Like I had a great time there, and Coach Lauby is uh, is the director there, and still, and he was when I was there, and still is. Uh, and he's a tremendous, amazing coach and father, and you know another person in the line of people that I worked for that almost seemed to go out of their way to make sure I had a great experience. Um, so I couldn't say enough good things about him and how he how much he helped me in that period of my career. Yeah. It sounds like you got into like really good spots in terms of, I mean, and, and the commonality too, is like you're sending out like resumes, emails, uh, letters, what have you, uh, depending on what year it was, of course, but uh, just reaching out a lot and then you get some mm-hmm. opportunities and it sounds like you really landed in good places that um, you had good oversight and they let you do your thing, but at the same time they understood, you know, what you were there for and, and it seemed like a good experience. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I will, I will give myself due credit in that I, I did well in those places, at least partially because I'm a good coach, but I got so incredibly lucky. Just one, like you just said, one job stacked on top of another of, Oh, worked for a, a great guy here. Next job. Wow. Worked for an equally great guy and just kept And, and mm-hmm. uh, even before the, you know, Dr. Dr. Sell and Dr. Gidgerelli at Hofstra, like they took a, I mean, they had so many, other things to more important things to deal with. And, and like Dr. Sell still made sure that Connor knew where to go do his internship and how well it was going to go. And yeah, like you're, I say to anybody that'll listen, like I am, I did well with the opportunities that I was given, but I was given a lot of opportunities. Like I got super duper lucky to work for those people. And that was not of my doing. I didn't go, I didn't have a bunch of different opportunities to take and then decide to take one based on some research that I did about that particular guy running that place. It was okay. Waldorf is the only place that's going to hire me as a GA boy. I hope the guy that runs the place is a good guy. <laughs> and it turns out he was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, you're still proactive about it and creating sure. a little bit of opportunity for yourself. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the one point I want to get across to some of the coaches I talk to or something like the younger athletes too. It's like, those who want to get into this um, because they like sports or, or what have you, or whatever their passion is, even PT, of course, too, or athletic training. And uh, it's like, yeah, you got to be proactive and reach out and like send some emails and, and send some resumes and, you know, yeah, absolutely. A little bit and, and, and mix it up. Um, so I was at UNF uh, University right. of North Florida before I was at Flagler and lo and behold, the head coach at University of North Florida is Brian Burt, the guy that I, the assistant at the time at Hofstra who I interned for. Um, and so he, when I, I'm from Pittsburgh, so I, when I graduated from Hofstra, I went, I was living with my parents and he happened to get an assistant job at university of Pittsburgh. And then he was there for the two years that I was at Waldorf. And so anytime I came home to Pittsburgh, I would always reach out to him and we would get a cup of coffee or something and we would chit chat and things like that. And then when I was working in the private sector, 
he calls me up and doesn't offer me a, a job. He says, Hey, you know, we're, we're looking for somebody and I'm not going to hire you just right now. But if you, if you want an interview, you know, if you want to, if you want me to throw your name in, in the, in the ring, I will. So just by a being a good intern, whenever I was working for him and then B keeping up with him and, and calling him up whenever I had legitimate questions. It, I wasn't just doing it because I, I was thinking like, Hey, I better keep this guy in my back pocket in case he's got a job for me. It was legitimately, I respect his opinion. I res I respect his knowledge as a coach. So if I have questions, I'm going to call him up, which I did. Um, so just by keeping up that communication and keeping up that relationship, I, you know, he, he fortunately respected me, my work ethic enough uh, and my knowledge just to, to reach back out and say, Hey, seems like this guy might be suited for something, you know, something that th this thing that became available. Yeah. You never know, right. You just keep in contact yeah. with uh, who you're with and you know, what's yeah. the worst thing that happen? You, you have a friend that you're, you know, bounce ideas off of, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like the worst case yeah. scenario was I have a, I have a great contact who I can reach out to. Uh, he and I still talk, you know, for maybe once a month or a little, you know, from time to time. Um, he's called up, called me up to talk about possible job opportunities and, uh, that, that he was thinking about taking, or I've called him up about similar ones, things like that. Um, or just, uh, or, or, or just going to Buffalo Wild Wings and shooting the breeze and, and like being friends. Like he, you know, he and I went to Steeler, uh, a Steeler game whenever I was in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, when I, when I worked for him for a year and a half at, at UNF, we'd go out to Taco Tuesday, things like that. So we still, um, to strip away all the good things about having a coach like that to, speak to about professional things he's a, a friend yeah exactly and i will say this i'm from maryland originally originally so you mentioned like Steeler stuff like my dad being from baltimore and talking about like ravens and Steeler stuff and then having mm -hmm. to even think about um you know the capitals and, and the penguins i got a real sore spot about that so i'm gonna glaze over that a little bit <laughs> and go just to the next section i um i so i played baseball at george mason um and my first roommate was from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And mm -hmm. he would spend a lot of time in Pittsburgh. And then my second roommate, uh, when I transferred to UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, where I graduated from my undergrad, um, he was actually from Pittsburgh. So he would talk about Pitt all the time and all the yeah. crazy, you know, sandwich <laughs> places and different things and all the... For Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he had a lot of names. You know, a lot of names. <laughs> and going to fill anything of that nature. But um, go, going back to the, uh, the bread and butter of this, so within, okay, you're at Hofstra, you're at RMU, uh, you make a GA jump. And how, how has Coach G changed from, you know, going into the weight room over at Hofstra and figuring, okay, this is what I want to do. How have you evolved in terms of, like, you know, even before UNF, um, where you're at with your philosophy, where you're at with, like, how you train athletes. You, you mentioned you make mistakes. Everyone does that, of course, too. Now it's just trying to, like, mm. mitigate them as much as possible. What, what do you think changed from your internship to internship to your GA ship? I think probably the biggest shift initially was realizing how much isn't in the book, just how much yeah. isn't like, it, but, but the book exists for a reason. Like the, there is a necessary framework that you need to work within in terms of uh, anatomy and physiology and, you know, responses that the body has to training and, and nutrition and things like that. Like there are things that are more or less set in stone that you still need to abide by, but, um, outside of that, which is 90% of the rest of the job is stuff that you either won't learn at all, um, or is very briefly touched on. And then you realize, oh, wow, there's a lot more ways to skin a cat than I thought. Um, so I think from, from internship to internship, I don't know if there was much of a change just because it was, it was a, I, I would just call it a continuation of the internship experience from internship to GA, it was realizing how, how strength coaches are regarded in terms of what athletes think of them. Uh, you know, it's, it's this odd sort of gray area. You're not a, you're not a sport coach, so you don't have any control over whether they're starting. Uh, you, you're not a friend, so you're not going to gossip. You're not a parent, so you can't ground them or, or, you know, be pissed off at them when they come home to you but you're still, the, you're still an authority figure and you're still somebody that they see enough that they, if you're a good coach, hopefully they trust you. So there's a lot of things that you'll be faced with that you didn't know 
you were going to get faced with until it happens. And without getting really specific, you know, bo- both male and female athlete- athletes have come to me with some pretty, pretty heavy stuff that in no way is it, it, it's not in any textbook. Hey, by the way, someone's going to tell you that X, Y, and Z happen, and you're not going to be remotely qualified as a 23 year old to deal with it. Uh, but nobody else is going to be in the building and this person's having a breakdown. So you better figure something out. Um, so, so re- realizing how much more uh, the job was than just putting a program together um, from, from the GA to the, to the, the, the assistant position at UNF um, buy-in in turn and not getting your athletes to buy in, but you buying into your athletes. So learning that the, one of the best ways to get somebody to do what you want is to care about what they do. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that coach Burt taught me was I, I, he, he hates and I hate using the term small school because Flagler is by definition, a small school. UNF by definition is a low major division one. They're a small school, but as, so it's it's one thing like we don't have to ignore that like we can we can admit that there are difficulties that come with that we we don't have an ohio state budget you know for example but that's where it ends like we don't have to act like we're a small school this is don't i i don't like when people say the next level or you know where are you going to go next well this is my next you know what why why can't unf be my next why can't why can't you or at the time while i was there he was like you know this is your alabama this should be your Alabama. It, it's, I don't care if that's your goal is to eventually end up at the Alabama or at, at Ohio state. But for the time being, nobody better know that you're looking for quote unquote, uh, the next step or the, or the, you know, a stepping stone. Like you need to treat where you are as the best possible place it can, it can be. Cause otherwise you're, whether you know it or not, you'll, you'll consciously or subconsciously do a worse job. So if so, th- and that's what I took to Flagler was, I don't care if we're a Division two school with twenty five hundred people in, you know, St Augustine, which is the the sleepiest tourist town in America. Like, I don't want to see a UF shirt in my weight room. I don't want to see an Ole Miss shirt in my weight room. You don't go there. You go to Flagler. So, right. doing the best possible job where your feet are planted, um, and just having respect for what you do um and and now it's over the last i'd say six months probably the the thing that is that i'm trending towards or that i'm I'm learning more about that's really really shaping um or reshaping how i do things is uh my interpretation of periodization so there there's you know, my sort of belief is that, yes, there's a there's a baseline that you can program around. Uh, but on any, on any given day, based on a trillion other factors that have nothing to do with with what you did, um, it's, you know, sleep and emotional status and, and a whole bunch of other things. An athlete might wake up and their baseline is in the basement or or maybe it's the other way around and they're having an amazing day. So you can say, OK, two weeks from now, we should be hitting. Uh, four sets of two at at ninety three percent. Well, that's all well and good, but if they wake up on that day with after three hours of sleep and two midterms and their boyfriend just broke up with them, like yeah, good luck hitting four sets of three at at ninety whatever percent. So, um, being much more broad in my framework of programming and understanding that yes, going back to what I initially said, there has to be some parameters that are based on anatomy and physiology. Um, you know, I can't just have yoga days, three days a week, anytime somebody complains a little bit and expect people to get stronger. So you do have to get outside your comfort zone. You do have to push through some things, but the athlete, um, the priority needs to be the athlete dictates your programming far more than your programming can dictate the athlete. Um, and then just the just the in the intangibility of it all so and it goes back to you know how they're doing psychologically how they're doing emotionally and and just their emotional and psychological health um i one of the the certifications that i did was uh precision nutrition which is super popular right now just a lot of people are doing it and 
the second half of the book is not about it's it's not the the theory or or anything about nutrition remotely it's it's their coaching philosophy and i really like how they break it all down in terms of they every every person is different um it's it's much more about sustainability and cons- and, and adherence and consistency and all of those things come differently for different people. So everybody falls on the spectrum of here's how consistent I am. Uh, here's how, here's how consistent I can be, but you have to figure out, you can't just tell them, okay, here's the way to be consistent and then send them away. If like I, I told one of my athletes one time, uh, he was having a meeting with me about nutrition and I said, does that sound good to you? And he said, I'll do whatever you say. And I told him, that's great. Like that, that's not something that you should feel bad about. And I'm not going to try to make you feel bad that you're willing to do anything to succeed. That's terrific. But if I say that to you, how does that sound? And you say, great. But in the back of your head, you're like, dude, that sounds miserable. There's no way I can do that. Then I don't care how much grit and grind you have eventually, whether it's a day, a week or a month, you're going to fall off. You're you're not going to be able to adhere. So as I said earlier, there's more that there's a thousand different ways to skin a cat. So if somebody wants to do X, then I have the, the way initially that I come up with that I think is the most effective, but if it's not the one that's going to work for them, then I need to change. They don't need to change. Right. Right. I, you just unpacked uh, a huge load of like really good information there. Uh, <laughs> like, and I, hopefully like when people are watching this, they go back and listen to that more than once and, and focus on like, condensing what we have in regards to like what they teach you in the book. Like we don't really need to know about altitude training and things of that nature. If we're working in a muggy St. Augustine, um, in like mid to Northern Florida, we don't need to know certain X, Y's and Z's. What we do need to understand though, like, like you mentioned before, coach, she is, uh, training parameters. If you have a plan of what's going on, you have your periodization or, or what you'd like to use and what's comfortable with you and your athletes. Um, but the root of it is like really getting to know your athletes on a one-on-one basis and the individual, mm-hmm. you know, within their individual um, sectors and then like planning out and like kind of branching off from there. Of course, you know, if someone is constantly, if like your ears are sore because they're complaining most of the time, maybe they don't, they don't need another yoga day. Maybe they need a little bit extra push. Maybe they need to back off things of that nature. Somebody who never complains says something finally they're a little bit vocal um, and you know, they're a little bit quiet. Maybe they do need a little bit of a a regen day and things of that nature, which is also important to know, but you got to know the athlete um, and and who their cohort is too, right? That that takes a lot of time and just like, you know, buying in and, and what you said before, it's like, you got to know that they got to know that you care. That's super important. Yeah. The, like it's, it gets repeated all the time. Uh, it's so much so that it, it, it has almost become a cliche, but it's, it gets repeated all the time for a reason, but athletes don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. I can't even say that anymore. Like without, without messing it up. Cause I've said it so many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're going to think about it. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the truisms of, you know, what we do um with building relationships um yeah like i, I just don't, you, sorry just, just just to it was just reaffirming what you're saying like i don't know how you can expect somebody to take you seriously if um you're never at if you're never demonstrating that you care about the things that they're doing like yeah okay the, the the reason that you that a coach can chew an athlete out at the top of their lungs and screen and and for the record i'm not i'm not that kind of coach just because not because i don't think you should coach that way, but just because it doesn't work for me. Um, but you, there's a, there's a reason a coach can absolutely eviscerate an athlete to their face. And then the next day there, or, 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 you know, at the banquet, the athletes like, I love that man, or I love that woman. Like that's, and it's because they know that regardless of how hard they're getting chewed out, that coach cares about them. And it's not the chewing out that's doing it. It's the other 99% of the time, when they're they're at practice and they're at their games and they're sending them a text on their birthday and things like that that demonstrates okay this person really actually truly cares about what I do and what happens to me so they when they're that upset with me they're doing it for a reason they're doing it because they care not because they just had a bad day and they feel like taking it out on me and it's not perfect you know some coaches do that because they're having a bad day but you know that's that's how you can uh that's how you're able to coach people hard. Um, it's, it's not because 
it, it's not the hard coaching that that does it. It's the it's everything around that that allows you to coach them that way. Yeah, it comes from a place of TLC, but at the same time, we need to drop hammer. It's, it's yeah. doable because you have the relationship already. Yeah. Yeah. So, so jumping from um, RMU now to UNS in, in Northern Florida, uh, when you got your assistant uh, set up, and now, like, of course, you're getting paid, you're like official, life is good. Uh, what, what was that experience like for you when um, you walked on the campus the first day and you started training your athletes? It, it, <laughs> it in the same way that it didn't feel much different as a GA compared to being an intern because the internship was so much like a GA. It really didn't feel very different because I was a full, like at, at UNF, I was a full-time strength conditioning assistant. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Waldorf, if you ask HR, I was a part-time gr- uh, graduate assistant strength coach. If you ask literally anybody else, I was the full-time assistant strength conditioning coach. So the only difference was, Hey, these guys jump a little higher. These girls run a little faster. Like the the only difference was going from the NAIA to division one, which was so like, okay, cool. We have a bigger weight room. We have more stuff. We have more sports. We have, we're more competitive, but other than that, it was all right, cool. Um, I'm used to 6 AM to 6 PM days. And, and there, there was, I really can't think of anything that was terribly, different or you know a a significant thing that was oh wow i didn't know you did that as a full-time assistant it was i got treated the exact same way as a ga that i did at uh as as an actual full-time yeah again another blessing in disguise when you're at waldorf and you know you're yeah in in, in title you're the assistant i mean you're a ga but like realistically you're you're the you're the next guy in line and then jumping over to unf it's like okay this is a pretty lateral transition even though it's, it's a little bit different um, you know, the structure, you, but you could call the, uh, you, you could call the stakes higher, maybe, uh, just, okay. you know, uh, you know, uh, men, you know, men's basketball is, you know, there's boosters that are donating a whole lot of money. So if, if somebody gets hurt, more people are mad or a more important person is mad, but like, I'm just trying to kind of rattle off in my head, like, what truly, besides just seeing Division One NCAA, uh, NAIA, what the actual day to day difference in work was, and maybe it was, maybe that's just the way I think. Maybe there's a ton of differences, but I didn't see it that way. Um, it was just going from being an assistant in Iowa to being an assistant in Florida, really. Yeah, I mean, maybe access to different, you know, things, whether it's resources or sure. you know, yeah. a little bit more of the economics, so you can do more things, but. Yeah, I mean, in terms of stakes, I mean, it, it feels the same. And, and that's always a good transition when you go into a new spot where you feel like, okay, I'm pretty comfortable with this now. I've, like, I've got my, um, you know, I've got my hours underneath my belt. I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, how does that help going into now your director of sports performance over at Flagler? And, and how did that transition come about? Well, it came about, um, I wasn't even looking for a position. Like, I enjoyed working at UNF. I liked working with my athletes. Um, I just every, everything about UNF, nothing had me disgruntled. I, I really enjoyed going to work, buying into all the sports. I was, I was, you know, watching all, all kinds of games and going to this, going to that traveling, uh, not traveling with teams, but, you know, going to some of their away games whenever I could, it, you know, I was enjoying myself and out of the blue coach Burt just walks in one day and says almost kind of in passing, Hey, there's a, there's an opening in St. Augustine that for a director position, you should apply. Um, so I wouldn't even have sprinkling known, that in. Yeah. Yeah. Like I wouldn't even have known it, that there was a, a position open had he not said anything. And then I applied fast forward six weeks and I had the job. So, uh, and <laughs> it's going to be a boring answer, but the only difference between Flagler and UNF was I was essentially my own boss. Now it was it, the, the only difference was, okay, now I'm programming for 15 teams instead of six, but that, but other than that, and because coach Burt treated me like a, like, you know, gave me as much responsibility as possible. And, he, and even when it wasn't my responsibility, he would fill me in on, Hey, I just had a meeting with X, Y, and Z. Here's how it went. Here's some weird stuff that happened, or here's, here's what happened this one time. Um, you know, he, there are plenty of things that he had me do that like midway through if I was struggling with it or if I kept asking him questions about it, he would say, look, 
I like, I'll, I'll show you right now. This is done. Like I have it on my computer. This is all complete. I don't actually need you to do this. I'm having you do this. So you know what to do when you, when I'm not around. Um, so that, you know, th that a hundred times over is what prepared me for Flagler. So again, it's, it's the, the, it's, I, I wish that I, I had this story of, you know, I was born to a single mother and we lived in a cardboard <laughs> box and I taught myself all these things, but I am just such a beneficiary of having incredible support everywhere I've been. My parents are, are one in a billion. My, as we just said, coach Burt, coach hammer. I mean, and, and I'm going to feel bad if I miss any name whatsoever, but Dr. Sell, Dr. Pedrelli, um, uh, Jason Lowby, like everybody that I've worked with has been thinking to themselves, Hey, this guy's going to go somewhere else sooner rather than later. Or, or, you know, at some point in time, he's going to, he's going to need these skills. I better teach them to him. No one has ever treated me like just some guy that works there that can take some work off of their plate. It's always been, they've always bought into me, which is a huge reason why. And I, I would hope that whether it was like, I had interns at UNF and I have assistants now at, at Flagler. And I would hope that they would say this about me that I'm, I've bought, I am bought into them. Um, you know, I care about their success far more than I care about their, their help. And I care about their help a great deal because they're immensely, I'm immensely fortunate to have them working for me and, and making my job that much easier. But at the same time, if an opportunity arises, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that they get it and, and, and that they're prepared for it. So I want to, you know, get as many things off of my plate and onto theirs, not because I need the, the respite, but because I want them to be ready to crush whatever opportunity they have um, once they get there. And, and they, like my, um, the, uh, an assistant at UNF that I worked with, Colin Corker, and he and I, like Coach Burt would expect a lot of us and rip us for, for getting stuff wrong, rightfully so. And he and I, when we were sitting in the office and Coach Burt wasn't there, we'd always be saying to ourselves, you know what, man? this sucks right now, but as soon as we go somewhere else, like we're going to get there and be like, seriously, this is it. Like, this is, this is all, this is easy. This is a walk in the park. And I'm not going to call it a walk in the park, but I'll tell you what, th there's not many places. Like I'd go right back to coach Burt. Uh, if I had the option again to prepare me for being a responsible adult and a strength coach running my own department, because he expected, uh, you know, one step, he expected one step above what an assistant is expected to do. And it paid off hugely and, and continues to pay off. Yeah. I, I like that you said it was boring because that just shows that you were prepared, right? And being a beneficiary of yeah. great leadership is, is what we would hope to be a, as coaches as well, right? When you have good quality coaches coming out from your system or, um, you know, different devotees, I guess, coming out from where you are, like Coach Burry, you think Coach Hammer. Um, you're overly prepared for what you're stepping into next so that the quality is there and then you're ready to go. You're really ready to rock and roll. And it's just another, um, another setup, although it's the same, you know, it's, just, it's the same thing on, on the job description, right? Mm -hmm. You just have a little more responsibility when you got 15 teams instead of six, it's a little more time programming, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit more attention to, you know, what the facilities are looking like. And then maybe even, you know, screening interns and, and GAs and, and assistants as well. Um, right. is that something that, that's on your, your docket as well in terms of like getting help, um, from people at the school, whether it's like interns, like I said, GAs or, or assistants as well. Yes. And that it was, we had an internship program at UNF and it was coach Burt's curriculum, but he put me in charge of doing all the interviews and deciding I, I would quote unquote decide who to hire, but I, I ultimately would tell him, Hey, here's who I would like. And. And he was still, for most of the interviews, he was in the room or, you know, he, he knew pretty well who he wanted. Uh, so I don't think there was ever a point where he and I disagreed. Um, but again, he made sure that he gave me the opportunity to, I never fired anybody, but to hire people and to evaluate them and to, to mentor and to uh, be the day-to-day -day supervisor of interns so that when I got to Flagler, uh, to answer your question, yes, uh, I have the I have free reign to hire however many interns I want. Um, I don't have uh, I have a, a a paid part time position, which is part time in the same way that <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 
And so, you know, I, 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 he was there, uh, coach Reeves was there before I was, um, but I would hire him on the spot again. And I, I have, you know, his, he's, uh, his contract is, is a year long. And so I've had the opportunity to re up his contract and I, I've done it without question because he's outstanding. Um, and then any interns that I wanted to bring in, I'm, I'm welcome to, there's, there's procedures of background checks and, you know, there's a formal hiring process, but if I, I, I can go to my direct supervisor and say, I'd like to bring this person in, here's their resume, here's all the appropriate paperwork. There's no reason why I wouldn't get a green light. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, San Augustine, super cool place. Um, as an aside, me and my dad uh, traveled, I think I, I was either six or seven, and uh, we actually ended up at Flagler, um, mm-hmm. going through some different places. And uh, my dad played basketball in college. So he, we'd always bring a basketball with him. We'd shoot around at like courts and stuff. And uh, mm-hmm. the gym was open. So we went in one day and just started shooting hoops after, before we were getting kicked out and stuff and off in different <laughs> places. Um, so I have to ask, since it's this part of the season, um, and this always like creeped me out as a kid, but like, what's the deal with the ghosts and the supernatural stuff? I got to ask, because that's <laughs> one of the down there with a touristy, like St. Augustine, uh, you know, first coast. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you, I mean, I, I can essentially just confirm what you're talking about. Like there's tons of haunted tours and, and mm-hmm. not even like around Halloween. Like you, it can be like middle of February and be like, Hey, take this haunted tour. Um, I haven't been here long enough to know what the story is behind all that. Um, but it's definitely a thing. And I, I, uh, I'm trying to think if it's, it was like Henry Flagler and then like the, the lady in black or something of that nature. Right. Um, right. It's, I, I know it's, it's certainly a thing within the town. I'm trying to think if it's, <laughs> if there's a lot of stuff related to actual Flagler college in terms of this, this particular building is haunted or, or whatever. But, um, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I wish I can give you a better answer, but I'm not, I, I, it's definitely a thing. There's, it's all over the place, it, all, all throughout the course of the year, but I couldn't tell you why that is, why that is. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things where it's like, okay, you haven't seen any weight plates moving in the weight room on their own or, or stuff like that. But, um, no. I mean, for, for recruiting purposes, like for where I am in like Orange County, we can recruit and say, Hey, we're in Orange County, uh, Newport's nearby the beach, nearby things of that nature. Like, I don't know if anybody's like, ghost hunting interested in like okay we're you know come to flyler college we got we got a little bit of this a little bit of that going on i, I don't know if we've managed to sell a recruit with <laughs> ghost hunting yet but if we do <laughs> there's gotta we've got it. coaches that i bet they could finagle it i bet I, you know we, we've got some pretty good pretty good sales people here <laughs> so like within like this global pandemic or whatever's going on now because things are you know constantly changing um in florida of course much different than california on, on the opposite side of the the you know, continent, um, or state rather on the other side of the country is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> land mass. Uh, on the land mass, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking intercontinental breakfast and how hungry, <laughs> how hungry I am right now. Um, what, what is your process or like, what are you guys going through in terms of like specificity to Flagler? Are you guys competing at all? I think you guys have like a cross country thing coming up or something of that nature. And then like, what are you guys mm-hmm. doing within like the training itself? Um, due to, you know, COVID stuff. We, uh, for, for quite a while, we didn't do anything. You know, we were, mm-hmm. uh, closed the gym, closed the campus, closed everything. Uh, we, at f- for all intents and purposes, have been training the whole semester. Um, we, at first it was, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what we've been doing this whole time and still do. It's, it's temperature checks before they enter the room. We have an app that we developed where they, you know, there's like 15 different symptoms, and if you check one of them, uh, your your phone turns red, and you have to go get screened. Um, you you have to get your temperature checked, and you have to show us a green screen every time you enter the room. Um, every if you're in the room, you wear a mask. Um, that's that's been a, a universal constant, and still is, you know, up until today, and still will be, and for the foreseeable future. Um, what we were doing previously was we uh looked at the cdc guidelines of amount of people that can be in a room and looked at the max number and instantly subtracted 10 right you know i forget what the the official number was but we just made sure that for the square footage that we had um we were way under the amount of people that could be in the room so that if for whatever reason 
uh, some, we went over, you know, if, if the number was 15 and there were 17 in the room, okay, we're actually still under that by eight. Like at no point are we remotely close to being, uh, creating any sort of a, a, a health hazard. Um, we you know, created as much circulation as possible. So every single door and orifice for lack of a better term is propped and kept open the whole day. Um, we, for the first three weeks, what we did was we set out a five, a pair of fives, tens, 25s, and 45s, uh, and spaced them out around the room. And we just did circuits, uh, standing in place at, at least, you know, bare minimum six feet apart. Uh, so for the teams with more than 15 people, uh, instead of hour long sessions, we would go half hour sessions. Um, and still, so, you know, baseball has 47 guys. So split them into pitchers and position players. Uh, what, we, what we would typically do is they 10 to 11 is pitchers, 11 to 12 is position. Um, so instead, and, and there's, there's 23 and 24 people. Uh, so to break that down even further, it was 10 to 1030, this group of pitchers, 1030 to 11, this group of pitchers. And so just, you know, we shortened the time blocks as much as we needed to the point where, okay, we can safely say that we have X many X amount of less than X amount of people in the room. Um, and then, you know, so whatever circuit we were doing, they had weights available to them. Uh, we had hand sanitizer stations at every door. Um, we had three different wet wipe dispensers in the room. And we've got, uh, you, you, have you seen The Dark Knight? Mm -hmm. uh, you know that scene where the Joker has all the mobs money and he sets it on fire? Yeah. The big, like, we have that the in money. the form of wet towels. Like we have that in the form <laughs> of, of wet naps. So we've got, uh, and so those get, we probably go through a dispenser a day. Um, but at anything that anyone touches gets wiped down. Um, so we are, it, and every single decision that I make, it's not just me. It's, it's not just me sitting in my office thinking, Hey, this sounds like a good idea. I consult with my director of sports medicine. Uh, he's, uh, even more cautious than I am. I have full trust in him to whatever he thinks is best based on, um, you know, NCAA guidelines, CDC guidelines, right. anything else, any other piece of information that we can consider legitimate is being implemented in in the best way that we know how. So we feel as though we're going above and beyond what's what's necessary. Yeah, it's better to do it in an excess than to not do it and fall short. Yeah, and have to shut everything down. So you talked about uh, programming. How has like the need for creativity, like really spurred, like what's going on with, with how you not only just develop time with the block, but like who's coming in when, um, but is everything pretty general right now? Cause some athletes have had a layoff and they haven't been able to do anything. And now they're kind of ramping back up again. Mm -hmm. Um, and then some athletes, maybe they have a little bit of this or that at home. Um, how have you really like gotten creative and kind of gotten in the mix in terms of like having headaches and, and just seeing what the programming is and seeing where mm -hmm. the, time thoughts of, of what's successful and what's not we we've kept like to your point about programming we've kept it very general so every you know we've looked at it in the sense that everybody is in their off season so the the way we approached it was okay let's just assume the worst and that everybody has been in their basement for the last three months and has not done a thing so in in good conscience we cannot just hop back into anything so which is why we spent the first three weeks as reorientation with just first it was first we didn't even put the weights out it was body weight circuits then it was weight weighted circuits then it was okay let's get back under a bar but uh it's only empty bar tempo work um so we you know the nsca i, I think it was a joint statement with the nsca and the cscca but they sent out quite a bit of material saying hey here's the percentages for weeks one two three and four that we feel you should are our best practices uh, which we utilized. So we, again, in the same way that we set up the room for by CDC guidelines, we looked at, here's what any governing body big enough that we know what it is says, okay, let's look at the best way that we can implement that. And so if it, it, it manifested itself as body weight circuits, weighted circuits, tempo work with an empty bar, tempo work with a uh, somewhat of a heavy bar or somewhat of a weighted bar. And, you know, now we're, we're back into the swing of things and we're able to train the way we usually train, but we've had no uptick whatsoever in 
soft tissue injuries or otherwise. Uh, our teams are practicing, and we we're just just repeating myself. I in no way have we seen an abnormal amount of oh man, boy did we hop back in the training too soon. And I've had a couple conversations with some coaches of yeah legs got really heavy today. So there's still some some things that are notable of wow that that week of practice really took it out of them compared to what usually happens but that's the worst it's gotten and it's, i think that's that's a testament to you know i like to think we did a good job getting back into it but that's a testament to the understanding that all of our sport coaches have of periodization we didn't have a i really can't think of any coach that s- thought to themselves all right cool uh practice is back on let's do it and that was it uh every coach was talking to me was talking to to colin about our our, our director of sports medicine colin uh you know, they wanted to know, hey, how should we go about this? What do you think is the best thing to do? Uh, I, I'm thinking about starting this day, but what are your thoughts on it? It was a very, very collaborative. And as a result, I think went, given the circumstances, pretty well, pretty well overall. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. No, it's really good. I mean, I think the PSCS or the NSDA rather and the PSCBA, um they sound like an infographic of, of a bunch of stuff yeah. like that. And there was some yeah. other accompanying information that was really mm-hmm. good. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's ever really been a time, you know, transitioning from an off season where everybody's in the same place, no matter like what the sport is, we don't know yep. what's going on. Uh, we can really focus on just movement and the quality thereof. And, and then also like tissue quality, and, and like you mentioned how about work and different things like that. Um, I think it's been like, it's, it's been a cruel blessing, of course, right? Cause we're not able to do certain things. We're not looking at like a roadmap of where we are with an annual plan of, you know, where we should be and like when we're competing and, and, and what have you. But um, everyone's really focused on what they're doing right now. And I felt like, at, at least with us, um, there's a really good attention to detail on what they're doing that builds a huge foundation at base for eventually when the, you know, when we flip the switch, what we should be able to get into later when we can peak and start getting yeah. the priming and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's terrible that, you know, we're not able to do things and seasons are canceled. But um, where where are you guys right now with, with um, you know, with the Peach Belt, you guys are the southernmost team in the conference, correct? And there's a lot of teams in Georgia. Um, where are you guys in terms of, like, is there an idea of when we'll be competing or, or like, what's going on with that? And um, within that, before COVID, like, did, did you get to go to games at all, like home games or, or travel with them at all? With certain um, uh, pretending that there's not a global pandemic, the, the, typical, <laughs> the, the typical routine would be, um, I, I just, just because of, the necessity of for my availability in the weight room, I wouldn't be able to travel with teams. Um, mm-hmm. But I went to as many things as I possibly could. Like and any any home game, I actually had a, a giant master sheet in Excel of hey, here's every home game, here's every game that uh, for every team at Flagler that occurs in St. Augustine per semester, and then I cross reference that with my weight room schedule. And then I just basically checked a green box of, okay, here's all the ones that you don't have an excuse to miss. Um, so that's the pro tip right there. That's good. Yeah. So even, um, even like our golfers, we, our golf team usually only has one home match around per semester. Uh, so I always made sure I was at that, you know, the, obviously if I, I, I would look at, okay, I've been to seven, of these matches, I've only been to three of this one. They're both going on at the same time. I'm going to go to women's basketball instead. Um, so the the only team that I traveled with, uh, and I didn't even ask, like they, they very graciously uh, wanted me with them. Um, our women's soccer team made an amazing Final Four run last year, um, and I, they started started the year 24 matches unbeaten, and then our first loss was in the semifinal of the tournament. was was the Final Four. Um, and it was hosted in Pittsburgh, where I'm from. And so before, like when we we hosted the Elite Eight, and before we even walked off the field, Ashley, the head coach, walks up to me and says, "You're coming, right?" Uh, so and so that was awesome. And and I was just talking to um, Coach Bates, one of my one of my volunteer assistants, and she, uh, her, and I were talking about uh, sort of the two ways that you can go about being a college strength coach. One is be a director and supervise 15 different teams or uh, be an assist, uh, you know, be a high level assistant somewhere and uh, only have two teams or maybe even only work with one team. So you have X amount of energy and attention. Do you want to spread it across 250 people and get to know all of them a little bit? 
or do you want to put it all into these 15 basketball players and get to know them as intimately as possible? Um, and so getting to travel with women's soccer gave me a look into like, man, this would be like, like I cried whenever we lost. Um, but I, I would have, it would have been even uglier if I had traveled with them for the other 14 matches that they, that they were away for. So that, that was a really cool perspective to get of being, feeling like I was a part of the team. Like it, it kind of took me back to high school football, you know, riding the bus to upper St. Clair and, uh, and then, and riding home with all my teammates and riding home with the coach and things like that. So I thought that was really neat. Um, but I still, I, I wouldn't be able to, as much as I'd like to do that with every single team. Um, and every team has been nice enough to say, Hey, you know, if you're free, we're, you know, we'll get you a hotel room or we'll, we'll buy a plane ticket, whatever it is. I, I just can't because I'm a third of our, our workforce. So I gotta, I gotta be around. Yeah. That would, that's like leading right into the next question. Is like, how do you balance work, work in life and like whatever you like to do in, in your time outside of, you know, campus, um, within, okay, you've got 15 teams, you're looking over interns, assistants, things of that nature. And then you're also, you have X amount of athletes, you know, hundreds of athletes that you're, you know, getting to know. Um, especially at a time like this, when everything's kind of shut down or everything's kind of like creeping back in, how do you take time for yourself within, you know, the realm of self-care? Um, the short answer is I'm, I don't, I'm bad at it. Um, yeah. the, <laughs> actually the, the pandemic like helped me realize like I'm, I'm that, I'm actually not that interesting of a person. <laughs> like once I, once I, uh, I mean, I, so, so the, the, the main thing that takes up my time outside of being a strength coach is bodybuilding. Like I'm a, I'm a competitive bodybuilder. I have a show on Halloween in two weeks. Um, so that, so I can say that, that that's a, a hobby of mine and that, that takes up a lot of my time and it, it's something that I, I put my time into, but I guess it just meshes I mean, it's, yeah, you're really branching out there, Connor. What, what do you do with, whenever you're not training other people? Well, I train me. So, you know, I, I wish I could say, and I, I like to, there's a couple things I like to do. You know, I, I, um, I have a, a fitness Instagram account that I train online clients with and I, I, uh, I like to cook. So, you know, I look for healthy fitness recipes, things like that. But if, so, if, you know, if, if the realm of fitness disappeared, I'd be pretty screwed. So I, I, uh, the pandemic forced me to realize that I need to, I need to start looking around for stuff that has abs, not just, not just it's not involved with work, but it has absolutely nothing to do with anything remotely related to fitness. And I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just, I'm coming up with snake eyes. Like I, I have, there's, there's just, whether it's, you know, my, my buddies, uh, my buddy likes to travel and hike. Uh, I have a friend that works at a winery, so he's getting really into, uh, you know, wine tasting and things like that. And all of those things that, that I, I, I won't denigrate them or, or, you know, say that they're a waste of time or anything, but they just don't appeal to me in, in terms of, I can see myself like, uh, if I, I look at it as if somebody suddenly just said, boom, you have, you have eight hours of spare time. What are you going to do? I don't really have an answer. I, I don't have a good answer of like, oh, sweet, man, I'm going to, I'm going to keep working on this. Like the, the closest I got to it was I wrote a 40 page ebook it, uh, with my spare time during the pandemic about uh, meal prepping. So it was it still had to do with fitness and nutrition and all that. But, you know, I could, I, at least I could say I wrote a book. <laughs> well, I, I mean, even though you are a strength conditioning coach, it's like, it's not really work at this point. I mean, it's, it's a lot of effort and a lot of energy, not to say that you're not working, um, but it's a profession. And it's like, if you, if you love it so much, it's like, it's, you know, it's what it yeah, is. And, and within the realm of that, you know, it's for the time being that works. But I do think that I, I certainly wouldn't recommend to people, Hey, do what I do and, and have almost nothing that motivates you outside of something of uh, uh, the realm of one thing. Like I, you, you mentioned self care. I think that's really important. Uh, I'm just bad at it. I, 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 I wouldn't look to myself. I wouldn't look up to myself as an example of here's how you manage your work in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's a commonality in a lot of strength coaches, especially when they're in charge is like, I used to compete in powerlifting more often than not. And, or like train for that. Now I'm just, you know, shooting the breeze and things. I'm sure you got bodybuilding. I'm sure a lot of mm -hmm. coaches, you know, still train, uh, like an athlete that they were. Um, with your with your bodybuilding, what are you like? What division are you competing in? Is it um, and you know 
I don't, I don't know what the different divisions are in terms of like classic or what's going on with, uh, you know, when you're wearing board shorts or not wearing board shorts, what have yeah. you. <laughs> right. Uh, but, it's, well, I'm, I'm pretty green as, as well. Like that's, I, I, I have my own coach. Like I'm a strength coach who has, who hired a coach because, so important though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like coaches need coaches. Um, so I, I, Hired him because a there's no possible way that I can get an objective view of my body through my own eyes. Like I, I think I look the exact same. I've been prepping for 27 weeks, and I think I look the same. That's because I just have horrifying body body dysmorphia. But uh, so I have him to to be able to say, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, because if I'm programming for my athletes, I can do that no problem. But if I program for me, I I. I've written my own programs for myself up until just the last six months when um, uh, Derek, my coach has been, has been doing it for me. Um, but especially now when my energy is, energy is at an all time low and you know, I'm, I'm not used to seeing my body in the way it is. I would have freaked out by now and said, no, 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 I need to start eating more. I need to do this. I need to do that. And he's been able to say, Nope, I know exactly what you're describing. You need to keep doing the thing that you're doing. And, you need to keep doing this until this time. So, so as far as the divisions, that's another reason I hired him because I know nothing about the actual sport. So I needed him to tell me, okay, we need to compete in this, this, and this. Here's what you should sign up for. So it's, if I remember correctly, I'm doing three, uh, three of them. One is there's open and novice. So open is just, if I remember correctly, it's anybody, no matter what. Um, novice is if you've never placed in money before if you've never you know uh, got if you've if you've never placed high enough then you're still a novice so open bodybuilding novice bodybuilding and i think open physique um the, the board shorts i'm pretty sure is classic physique so bodybuilding physique. and regular physique are both you know the the speedos so and my athletes are are razzing me right now because they're like are you getting a spray tan are you gonna shave your head are you gonna shave your beard like yeah man i'm gonna look like the trophy yeah that's the goal right yeah yeah that's the goal i you know when, when you were mentioning getting a coach too i i immediately thought back when i was competing um in powerlifting here and there that my my own training now is just dog meat it's just like whatever i feel like doing <laughs> that day you know it's it's gutter yeah. trash um but when i was programming for myself uh it's easy to burn yourself out you know, mm. so I, I hired a coach for about a month or so and like, it's all kind of good. I'm like, Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. I just need to, I just need to know what's on the sheet and to do that and not think about why I'm doing it and try yeah. and separate, you know, athlete from coach from, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing and needing and mm -hmm. everything. So, um, I want to go back to the ebook. Though, that's interesting when you're, when you're writing a bunch of pages for an ebook for meal prepping and a guy with that, is that something you were doing while you're bodybuilding while you're like prepping? Um, and then like how, how quickly or like how slow did that happen? Like if, if you're really passionate about something, you can like knock, knock things out. But I feel yeah, like that's um, one of those things where, you know, you were driven to do it. I, it started as I have a, I have a couple online clients and I, I, I'm helping one, uh, uh, some I, I write programs for some, I just help sort of with lifestyle choices. Like I'm not, I don't write a specific meal plan, but I will, you know, help them out with, okay, let's let's focus. That was one of the things that precision nutrition was, was so good on is let's like, yes, you, you will have a level three client where, okay, let's, we're getting X amount of macros and weighing this and weighing that like that certainly exists. But right now, like, like think of the Paletta principle, like uh, the 80, 20 rule, like the 20%, the 20 most important percent is going to give you 80% of the benefits. So if you can't get the top 20% of nutrition, right, which is like eat consistently and avoid you know these objectively really awful things for you then why in the world are we going to start worrying about counting calories and counting macros and things like this so what i was doing was i just i thought i'd jot down some notes on okay here's how you like another good example is they weren't getting consistent they weren't eating consistently sometimes it was one meal a day sometimes it was six sometimes it was i forgot to eat today and so I was writing down some pointers on, hey, here's how you can get in front of that and prep some food so that you don't, one of the biggest roadblocks for people is, I, d I got home from work, nothing is prepared. Okay, I'm going to bed or I'm going to go get fast food. So, hey, here's how you can prep some things that will have you 
that can take care of that for the next two or three days. And one, you know, a couple of paragraphs turned into a page, a couple of pages turned into, uh, you know, four or five, and then it turned into, okay, I'm not just going to write this for my client. Maybe I'll just write this for, maybe I'll make it five or six pages and I'll write it for my athletes and I'll include it in their summer packet or in their winter packet. And then, then once it got to like 10 or 12, I was like, okay, I got to figure out what this actually is going to turn into. And so I decided, all right, screw it. I'm not going to worry about how long it ends up. I'm just going to keep vomiting all the words out that I, I think I need to put on this. And then I'm going to see where I end up. And once, once I put all the stuff out that I wanted to put out, I realized, okay, let me just, let me maybe clean this up a little bit and add some and organize it a little bit better. And I'll, I'll see what happens. And so it ended up being 40 pages. It's, it basically goes, it, it, it's, it's, it's meal prep for beginner beginners. Like, Hey, I'm 18 years. I'm an 18 year old college athlete. I've never even cooked for myself. What do I do? So it's, it, 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 it like defines what meal prepping even is. And then goes over, here's some really common kitchen, u- kitchen appliances that you're going to use. Here's some really common kitchen utensils. Here's the best method for storage in terms of refri- using the refrigerator, using the freezer. Here's, and, and then, you know, it separates into carbs, uh, really common carbs, really common fats, really common protein. And here's, you know, maybe six to eight examples of each type of macronutrient. So with protein, it's chicken, beef, fish, uh, I think I, I forget if I put dairy products in in uh, fats or not, but it, it would it mentions each one and it says okay here's here's the uh, it's across the country it's different you know you're gonna find chicken for four bucks a pound or two bucks a pound so it's here's the general price point you can expect here's some really easy ways to prep it whether it's baking it pan frying it um, what the heck other ways are there uh, like crock potting it or, or things like that and then here's how you store it. Here's how long it will usually keep for, so you know how much to prep. And then here's regional, here's some popular regional grocery store chains. Here's how to make a budget for your groceries. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of every subsection of the book, but I think that was generally the gist of it. Um, so it was, it's written for a college athlete who has never done that in their life and needs to, you know, learn how to subsist on their own cooking. But it's really for anybody you don't have to be an athlete to be in that situation so i sell it for 10 bucks on my uh it's not my website but it's it's a, a website called payhip that makes it super easy for you to just host digital products and then people can people buy purchase to unlock the download um so it you know i've sold maybe 15 20 of them so it it, it it's to me, that's a really long winded answer but it's it started as me putting a couple of thoughts together and I just realized I had about a million more thoughts than I thought I had. And then I just organized it into, okay, let me make this as legible as possible for other people. Yeah, no, no, no. Detail is good. Um, I, I mean, I wish I would have had that when I was, you know, that age, even like, even a little bit younger, just deciphering what the difference between a gram and an ounce is or like what yeah. a tablespoon and a teaspoon is. Like I remember, um, finishing high school and going into college and the, you know, my coach told me that I needed to gain 10 pounds before March 1st when the season official <laughs> starts and, um, getting creatine and like not knowing the difference between a tablespoon and a teaspoon and taking five tablespoons <laughs> of creatine oh yeah. and just like really loading it and thinking, okay, yeah. if I just, you know, doing do my due diligence research and everything of whatever research is, yeah. um, and say, okay, I don't really need to load creatine. If I just take five grams, three to five grams a day, yada, 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 make it happen. Yeah. And I'm taking up to like 20, 25 to 30 grams <laughs> and not backing off of that and having like really bad stomach pains and things. Like, yeah. I wish I would have paid attention <laughs> or, or, or do a little bit more before that, you know, just, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the frailty of being young, but, um, yeah. Hey, I want to roll out, roll out the red carpet, um, where people can find you in terms of like, um, social media course. And then like with your, with your online products as well, uh, with coaching, uh, if you could just give us where you're at so we can reach you. And then of course, want to honor your time. It's been, you know, close to an hour or so. Um, you know, I want to pick up, you know, your Saturday, of course. Sure. Um, the, probably the easiest way or like the most active that I am is Instagram. So it's just Connor dot get me. So C O N N O R dot G E T T E M Y. Um, the, the information like the, the pay hip, 
link is on my Instagram, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, one thing that we, we didn't really touch on that I like to make myself available for is, like we talked a little bit about mental health. Um, you know, I've had issues with it before. Uh, like I said, there's a ton of my athletes have expressed it to me one way or the other. Something is just simple as I'm having a bad day or a, so I'm having a really bad day, if you know what I mean. Um, so I, I give out my cell phone number. Um, and I've, I've given it out on podcasts before. Like, I really don't care if you know who I am or if I don't know you. Um, if you just need to message me on Instagram or shoot me a text message, like I really don't care. So my number is four, one, two, five, eight, zero, six, two, seven, one. Um, I'm trying to think of the uh, really outside of that. Um, I mean, the, any link that I wanted to share or any, anything else like that is on the Instagram. And then yeah, I even have a link to my Facebook page on the Instagram as well. So it's really just Instagram. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy you did that. That's actually like really important. And mm -hmm. you know, with the, the phone number for us too. So, I mean, I really appreciate that you would do that. That's yeah, awesome. Of course. For me listening or seeing it. That's really awesome. But that's all I got. Any, anything else from you? Uh, no, I, I, I like, um, I mean, I obviously follow you guys on, on social media. Um, I, I love that you're, you're doing the podcast. Um, I like listening. Yeah. I might not listen to mine, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I, uh, I, Anything that that is that anyone is doing to help the industry and help coaches in the industry uh, and help spread information, uh, young young or old, experienced or inexperienced, I think is terrific. So um, I I would just compliment you guys on on what it is you're doing and to keep it up. Awesome, awesome. We, we you know we appreciate it. You know you coming on of course and you know really really thank you so much for sharing what you got and you know sure, sure, um, I know I'm gonna like rewind this a couple of times or. I was, I was listening to some cassettes the other day um, from the NFC. I had a couple uh, that my dad had back in the day from like the 80s yeah. or something. And I'm thinking about rewinding and fast forwarding. You don't really <laughs> do that on YouTube. You just kind of just click no, wherever you are. You but um, I'm going to go back, write some notes down, some different things uh, when I re, you know, watch this eventually. But like, again, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Really appreciate your time um, and, and all of your insight, of course, too. So. Thank you. Thank, for, thank you for having me. All right. Ciao, guys. Thank you. Yeah.